Well, good morning, New Life Community Church, Norwich. Happy Easter. We remember this morning that Jesus was crucified. He was laid and buried, and that's what we celebrate on Good Friday. And today, we celebrate his resurrection. And because of his resurrection, there is hope. There is hope. No longer do we have to be slaves to sin. No longer are we subject to punishment. But because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, uh, he took our sin on the cross. So that's what we're going to celebrate this morning, his resurrection and the fact that he sits on the right hand of the throne of the Father. The work is complete, the one for all, Jesus Christ, our greatest high priest, our greatest sacrifice, our living hope. So if you could just join with me in prayer before we start. Lord, we're asking that we wouldn't focus on Easter dinners or we wouldn't focus on anything but you. And I pray that we would give just an hour of our time to focus on what's being said and what's being sung. I pray that we wouldn't focus on performance. I pray that we wouldn't focus on how good we need to make ourselves uh, look in front of God. Lord, we know that there's no one good enough to impress you. Lord, our good deeds are like filthy rags, but you knew this and you came and died for us. So God, I'm praying that the power of the gospel would be presented today and that you would do what you want to in this place. Save lives, encourage convict, do what you want to, be honored and glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Raising, and because he's risen, it is a glorious day to worship him and lift him up. Amen. Come on, church.
Chapter 1, starting at verse 3, it says, Praise be to God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his mercy, we have been given a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed to you in the last time. The greatest part is, is Jesus is not dead. He is not buried. He is our living hope. He sits in heaven, fully alive, at the right hand of the Father, signifying that the work of the cross, the work of beating sin is completed and done. And because of that, there's no amount of good things <laughs> that could ever prove your innocence. All that's needed is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you know what? You're saved because of that. And that's what we celebrate this morning, that his salvation is not just saving us at this moment, but it's continuing to make us look more like him and he's coming back for us one day. He's coming back. So we have a living hope. That's what we're celebrating this morning. So can we sing this as a church? In hallelujah, praise the one who said, come on, you sing,
Psalm 118, shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and I will proclaim what the Lord has done. 
The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is, a mar- it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horn of the altars. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, today we gather, Lord, to honor and to celebrate your son, Jesus, who you sent to redeem us from the death we so righteously deserved. Lord, this psalm that we just read, written a thousand years before his birth, his death, his resurrection, it speaks of this inconceivable Savior. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And Lord, we've wandered and we've strayed, but you've shown us time and time again that there is no mountain that you won't climb. There's no valley you won't descend, and there's no pain you won't endure. That you would leave the 99 to save the one. I was the one. Lord, this room is filled with the ones. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you are doing here. We thank you for the things that are coming to fruition, Lord. We look forward in faith, Father God, to the things you are doing. And we praise you, Lord, today in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon. Amen. Praise God. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, Happy Resurrection Sunday. Happy Easter. Uh, My name is George. I want to welcome everyone here to New Life Community Church Norwich. Before you take a seat, please turn around and greet a neighbor and declare to them that he is risen. I see a lot of new faces in the house. I want to welcome you all here. Very special warm welcome to each each one of you. If you will be so kind as to uh, take a look in front of you in the pews, there's a little uh, green and white card. That's our welcome card. If you could please fill that out. Um, That just gives us some information. That way we can get in contact with you to share with you everything that's going on here at New Life, what we have coming up in the future. And for filling that out, uh, we want to give you a free gift. So just hand that to one of the ushers in the back as you leave, and we want to give you something um, on the way out. Um, Okay, announcements. I got a few things. So um, we're finishing, obviously, our our Easter series. So starting next week, we're going to be starting a new sermon series. Uh, I'm going to tell you it's called Let's Talk About. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about your story, emotional health, and why it matters for your spiritual maturity. Together, we'll talk about anger, anxiety, depression, relational conflict, and how God wants to redeem our emotions to pursue a life of wholeness and fullness in Christ. So if you're, if you're new here and just want to let you guys know that's coming up, that's definitely a series you may want to come back for. Um, but obviously, um, you know, for those that have been coming sometime, just so you know what's, what's going on in the future. Also, um, we want to connect with you. We have small groups. Um, we have groups for men, women, young adults, married couples, and uh, a youth group. Um, so fill out the welcome card in this, the same card I, I mentioned. If you have you know, questions about that, you want to connect with someone about one of those groups. And I'll just give a teaser for the, the married couples. Uh, we will have some information next week coming up, so just be on the lookout for that because we're going to be starting something up uh, very shortly uh, with that. Also, just a reminder, three weeks from today is Mother's Day, so mark your calendars. Make a note because I know some of you, it just kind of creeps up, doesn't it, right? But uh, it won't now because I'm telling you, so don't, don't get caught. Um, okay, moving on. Um, if you're tithing or would like to give an offering today, you can place it in one of the envelopes and then um, put it, either give it to the usher that's at the door on the way out, or there's a kiosk um, outside by the door. You can drop it in there. If you're writing a check, make it payable to New Life Community Church. Write Norwich in the memo. 
As always, you can give online through our app or website, which is fast and simple. Um, okay, please bow your heads and pray for this offering as we pray for this offering. Uh, Lord God, um, today as we reflect on the blessings that we have, Lord God, um, we, we obviously, Lord God, we know that uh, we have nothing unless it comes from you. So today, Lord God, as we uh, present this offering to you, Lord, we, we do so with humble hearts, Lord, and we would just ask, Father God, uh, that you would bless it, that it would be a, a blessing to your kingdom, uh, particularly those in this house, Lord God, particularly those in this neighborhood, in this community, Lord. Uh, we just ask that uh, uh, it would be blessed in your name, in Jesus' name, we ask, amen. And to introduce our pastor for New Life Norwich, Pastor Tom Fitzmorris. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. What a beautiful uh, time of worship together, wasn't it? Uh, and I'm grateful to see everybody. You can clap for that. They do a great job. Can I tell you something? They do. They do a great job. They get together with each other. They, they, they unify with each other so well. There's no one who's doing it for um, star appeal. I don't ever get that feeling. There's so many people who put so much effort into making our service is uh, enjoyable, and I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of it. It's a small part. It's a small part I'm playing. Um, it's really an amazing thing. All right, well, let's open up our Bibles to the book of John, chapter John, no, John, chapter 4, the book of John. It's the fourth gospel. And uh, we're going to read from verse 1 all the way to 26. But before we do that, we, we've got to pray. You know why? Because we're human. You know what that means? Uh, if you're like me, you make mistakes. You know where I usually make my mistakes? With my mouth. Whatever's in here and in here usually kind of comes out there. So I have to have guard protect my mouth. You know what else I've learned about humanity? Is that we can only hear a portion of what we're being told. And sometimes we can understand less than what we're hearing. So we need God to help us, okay? Father God, I just want to say thank you. Um, this is truly a wonderful day. You have... Uh, just like the psalm said, make our cup runneth over. And I don't think you're doing it because we look all that beautiful. I don't. I think you're doing it because you love us. And you don't love us because we're A students or we are really photogenic or we have wonderful voices. You've done it because you had your mind on us from beginning before time began. That's what I understand. When I read the scriptures, that's what you tell me. There are people here today who are going to hear this message and they're going to come out of the grave. So I can't deliver it. It's beyond me to do. I can't do it. I'm just a messenger. I need you to bring people to life. I need you to encourage the ones who already believe in you. I need you to call back the prodigal sons and daughters. I need you to do it because I can't. I can't do it. I've proven it time and time again. I don't have the strength. So we're asking you all this, Lord God. I'm asking you this in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, so 4-1, book of John. Now, Jesus had learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who was baptizing at all, but his disciples. So he decided to leave Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, now pay attention to this. If yours is your Bible, this is an important thing. In a narrative, I want you to understand something. When you come here, if you choose to come here, I want you to understand the word. I don't want you to say, well, that's what my pastor said. You know what? What if your pastor's a dope? I'm just saying. You know, what if he's wrong? I want you to be able to read it for yourself. So here's a detail that I want you to underline. If it's your Bible and if it's not your Bible, do it anyway. It says in verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. That's an important piece. He came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw the water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples, had, you see, had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. 
How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. See, prejudice isn't something that's new. We're kind of prone to it. You know, one of the things that we learn when we come into the presence of Jesus, he uncovers things about humanity, the heart of humanity, that we can't seem to escape. He has to rescue us from the inclinations of humanity, our broken flesh. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well, it's deep. Where can you get... Wait, I'm sorry, I, I passed him. So the woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How could you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with the world. The Samaritans. Jesus answered her, listen to this, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw this with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Can you hear the shade? This woman's a little salty. I'm just saying right now. She's giving Jesus the like, <laughs> okay, buddy. I'm, I'm just saying, this is, there's a whole lot in this, this thing, and this has really captivated me from the very first time I read it. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself and also did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks of this water from this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them, they will never thirst again. Indeed, the water that I give them will become like a living spring within them, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir... Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw the water. Jesus told her, go get your husband and come back. This is where it gets real serious. I have no husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands. And the man that you're living with now, you're just living with him. He's not even your husband. What you said it's quite true. Sir, the woman said, I could see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped here on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship that which you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation has come from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and is now here when the true worshipers of God will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. What the Father seeks, only he can produce. I want you to understand this. When we read scripture, we learn not only about ourselves, we learn about who we are through the revelation of who he is. And he's showing us some very vital things that we need to know about God. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. When he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I am the one that is speaking to you. I am he. And this is God's word. Uh, you know, years ago, I used to have a friend of mine. His name was Larry Kralis. Larry Kralis was a, I used to call him a real square nut, man. He used to come to church. He, he would be dressed like he was like right out of 1960s, none of the shirt all buttoned up. And he had jet, uh, not jet, like bleached white hair. He just was bleached white hair. And a couple friend of ours came to church and the husband didn't come for a while. And it was the mother with the two boys. And then the father decided to come on Easter. And Larry was giving the uh, announcements, just like George was today. And the youngest son was sitting next to the dad, and he goes, Hey, Dad, there he is. And AJ starts looking around, he goes, there, Who is? He goes, It's him. And he goes, Him who? He goes, That's God. <laughs> Larry had one of those faces. You know what I mean? You know, like, oh my gosh, this isn't just a regular guy. This is the guy talking to us. But one thing that I have learned, uh, it, it is very easy for us to have a distorted view of Jesus. Largely because what's been passed down to us is distinctly Europeanized. The first images, because there were no Polaroids back then, were painted during the age of the Renaissance. Jesus was gritty. He looked Italian. You know why? Because the Italians were painting him. But he's still, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay, it's okay. It's, it's, there's a lot of Italians there. I don't want to ruffle feathers. So listen, he was gritty. He was gritty, and you could see he had broad features. He had curly hair. He was dark. He was, he was earthy. But then something happened 
right around the late 1700s, man entered into an age, what they call the age of enlightenment. Because of a man named Immanuel Kant, he taught that everyone should question everything. That would be the paramount of what it is to be a learned person, a wise person. And Immanuel Kant was right. But what he didn't understand was it's okay for us to question everything as long as we really, truly question everything. And if I'm going to truly question everything, I have to question why I'm questioning certain things. I don't know about you, but sometimes I ask a question when I already have a decision made in my mind. I'm just looking for a smoking gun. Is that just me or is that anybody else in the house? So Immanuel Kant taught everybody they had to question everything. And philosophy, because of this, was now able to throw off the wet blanket of religion. This was an era of scientific advancement. The sophisticated and the educationally gifted outgrew their need for God. It was for the naive. It was for the ignorant, not the educated. But one thing I know, it's hard to make Jesus disappear. I'd like to say it's impossible. You know how I know that? Because throughout history, man has tried several times to get rid of Jesus. You simply can't. It's hard to make Jesus disappear. So society chose to reinvent him. Now the Jesus that was given to us was given a somewhat... Let's, let's show him up on the screen. See, he, he had a somewhat different look, wouldn't you say? His hair uh, became blonder. His brown eyes became blue. The curls in his hair were much less, and they became straight. And his physical body, he was no longer beefy and strong. He became slight. He became thin. And his eyes, I can remember those, those Easter movies. You remember the Easter movies when we grew up? Because that's what my mother thought was church, man. On Easter, we used to watch the, the robe and Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus always walked around like this. Like he was kind of walking, looking in heaven. Amen? I mean, I'm just saying, I'm not making, I'm not making a joke, but it's, it, it's kind of what it was. And the reason that this was, he was given this look, was because society had become more comfortable with a Jesus that was much less threatening than the original one. See, society has a tendency to love Jesus who is a life teacher. Someone who has secret knowledge and wants to help us to navigate life. But the truth of the matter is the only way that you can really know who Jesus is is in the pages of this book. No matter what anybody tells you, this is the only place you can find him. Some people say, I know him, I know him in my heart. You may think you do, but unless this matches up with this, you're deceived. I'm just telling you. You're going to hear a lot of uncomfortable truths here. You know why? Because wherever Jesus is, uncomfortableness follows. The prophet Isaiah told us of a Messiah who had no beauty or majesty. There was nothing in his countenance that would cause us to be drawn to him. I want you to think about that. If Jesus is who he says he is, when he came down to earth, there was nothing physically attractive for you to go, wow, that guy's different. You'd walk past him as if he were just another person. There was nothing in his physical appearance that would draw us. Isaiah was looking at his glory. Now, I want you to understand this. This is the glory that he was looking at. He said that this Messiah would be so disfigured that we would reel from his appearance, his face. We would not be able to tell if he were a man or a beast. Let's show that vi vivid image. I know that there's probably not a way for us to capture what happened on that fateful Friday, but I think that movie kind of hit a nerve because I think it was probably a little closer to reality than we're comfortable with. I want you to think about that. If he is who he says he is, this is what he looked like at the pinnacle of his glory. Kind of a strange way to look at the pinnacle of your glory. The establishment saw Jesus as a troublemaker, someone who had threatened the comfort of status quo. They were right. See, I'm convinced that the establishment 
the ones who had the authority, they didn't kill Jesus because they thought he was a liar. I think they killed him because they thought he was telling the truth. Can I tell you something? You could still do that today. It's real easy. It's real easy to push Jesus off to the side because he gets a little too close to that raw nerve. He most definitely is a threat. He has always been a threat. I've been following him for 23 years, and he's still a threat to me. He asked Peter and Andrew to leave successful businesses. He asked John and James to leave family tradition. He asked Matthew to leave a criminal empire that made him millions. He asked a, made, a man named Nathaniel to leave prejudice and resentments. Jesus calls his disciples to follow him. And where he leads us is to successive levels of surrender that will ultimately lead to us giving the deeds of our life back to the owner. That's God himself. Can I tell you something? Surrender of self will never be easy. And apart from grace, it's an impossibility. With grace, it's a daunting task. The scripture is clear. When we see Jesus, we see God. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a revolutionary that I've heard. Jesus is a revolutionary. Yes, he's waging war against your heart. He wants to come up and show you things about yourself that you won't want to listen. You won't want to look at. You will want to push him away, maybe even violently. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. I'm not making it up. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. He's not just a martyr who died for a cause. He is, by his own admission, the sole creator of the universe and all that exists within it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 16 says this. He is the, vis he is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the preeminent one over all creation. For all creation, whether things in heaven or on earth, visible or invisible, whether they're thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and been created for him and his purpose. That's you and me. Whether we accept it or not. You know, one thing I've learned about truth, and I think you could agree with me, it doesn't require me to acquiesce to it. I don't have to say, yes, that's truth for truth to be true. And I can prove it to you. We could get a ladder, walk up to the roof, and you may say, I can fly. I'll push you and see if that can happen. It won't. Truth is truth. And it doesn't need me to say, yes, it's truth. See, Jesus says, I am truth. Apart from me, you live confused, lost, and deceived. That's what he says. There are certain stories that paint Jesus with such vivid colors that from the first time I heard them, they captivated my heart. I was a terrible reader. Don't know about you. Didn't do good in school because I hated it. Didn't like authority. Didn't like teachers. Didn't like being told what to do. And I had the attention span of a gnat. And you know what? It's hard for me to read even to this day. I still have a hard time paying attention to things that I'm not excited about understanding. But from the moment I started reading scripture, strangely enough, it captivated me and kept my attention in a way that I cannot explain in no way. No way. And I remember reading the Bible for the first time it was on an airfield waiting for snow to come 23 years ago. I was waiting for the snow to come, and I said, well, I carried around the Bible for several weeks because I knew I had to start reading, and I go, this is as good a time as any. And I started reading from the book of Mark, and I read the entire gospel, and I fell in love. And you know who I fell in love with? I fell in love with Jesus. Even though I believed in him, because I had been saved. I was saved. It was, an, uh, it was an amazing, amazing transformational thing that I cannot deny. It is the testimony of how he brought me to himself. But I didn't know him fully until I started reading that word. And when I did, I fell in love with Jesus. I fell in love with him. Our story starts with Jesus baptizing other, on, on the other side of the Sea of Jordan, 
uh, the, the Sea of uh, the Dead Sea and uh, the River Jordan. So let me go up here. Jesus is is probably right about here. He's right about here. See, it would have come from Jerusalem, and John the Baptist would be on this side, and Jesus would be on that side. Well, John the Baptist's ministry started to end because. Guess what? John the Baptist had one job. It was to point to when the Messiah would come. And once the Messiah came, his role started to diminish. So he was gaining disciples. And the, and the, uh, the Pharisees, see, they didn't like it because they were losing their prominence in society. You know what? This is a valuable truth about what God wants to do in salvation. I want you to be aware. He says, I want you to go away so that I can fill the void. That's what he wants. He wants to take you away from you so that he can fill the void. So the Pharisees kind of got the hint, and they started to stir up trouble. And then we get to that, that, that portion of Scripture where it said, he had to go to this place, Sychar. Now, if he's going all the way up to Galilee, to a place called Capernaum, if you see him, it's right up at the top there. Why didn't he travel the 73 miles straight to Capernaum? That's the question I ask myself. Why did he do that? Why did he go 35 miles in this direction when he was going in that direction up 1,500 feet? It didn't make sense. I think to myself when it says needed, what did that mean that he needed to do anything? You know, the one thing that you will read, if you read the gospel, you read the gospel, any of the gospels, you go home this week and you start reading it, one thing you will understand is Jesus didn't feel the need to do anything. He was never motivated by what people would say of him. He didn't care if the crowds came. He said things not worrying about what the opinion or the public opinion or a political correct way of saying things mattered. He didn't care. He was on an agenda. He didn't get pushed. Fear didn't enter into what he wanted to do. He was on an agenda. And nothing would stop his agenda. And he made it very clear. I am here to do only that which my father commands me to do. Nothing stopped Jesus. He needed to do nothing. But it says clearly he needed to go in this direction. So Jesus went 30 plus miles uphill out of his way into an area. Listen to this. That most respectable Jews would have never gone to. Man, the hatred ran deep between the Samaritans and the Jews. The rabbis used to teach you, if you walk into Samaria when you walk back onto Jerusalem's land, you're supposed to kick the dust off. Even the dust on your feet is dirty. There used to be a very popular song. It would be better to be born a dog than to be born a Samaritan. Well, that's a lot of hatred. And can I tell you something? The Samaritans, they weren't innocent. They hated the Jews just as much. This was truly a hate Hate relationship. Isn't it funny how we can find reasons to hate each other? Isn't it crazy? And everybody always looks at the person who's hating and goes, you shouldn't hate. But the funny thing is, it's so easy to justify why we feel the same things. Because everyone does have some form of prejudice in them. Every one of us. They considered these Samaritans half-cousins. They were inbred. They did not have pure Jewish lines. They married outside of the Jewish people. They were half-breeds and traitors. And the people hated them. But this is where Jesus' itinerary took him. He travels to an area 35 miles out of his way with no major trade routes. That's one of the things I understood. When I looked at it, I was looking. There was no roads to get him there. He had to travel small roads up difficult paths to get to this place. He went out of his way. What does this tell me about God? God demonstrates his love for us in not only coming to us, but how much effort he took to get here. You know, can I tell you something? 
I don't care what people tell you. People say, I love you all the time. It comes out of their mouth real easy. But then you got to think to yourself, people also say they love pizza. You know the difference between speaking it and really meaning it? Effort. It's the effort that you put in to demonstrate it. God demonstrated effort to show you how much he loves you. I want you to think about that. If you're writing something down, that would be a wonderful thing to write down. It's quite a sacrifice. You can really tell how much a person loves you by how much they're willing to go out of their way for you. So as the story continues, Jesus arrives at his destination. It's Jacob's well on a mount called Ebal. It's about 11.30, maybe 11.45. It's just before noon. He sends his men off to get, uh, get uh, supplies to make camp. The scene is set because I want you to understand that Jesus just didn't fall into things. He made them happen from beginning to end. From beginning to end. No one killed Jesus. He sacrificed himself. I want you to get that. So Jesus sends the men and then... The reason for all of his efforts appear. A woman coming to fill water jars for the day. You know what's amazing about this story? A whole portion of scriptures is about this woman, and we don't even know her name. All this effort, I must go, all this way, 35 miles out of his way uphill to get there at the heat of the day to meet a woman who we don't even know the name. It's kind of an amazing fact for me. I want to wrap my mind around it. I don't quite know what to make of it. The woman's minding her own business. She's there to fill her jars. And Jesus makes the first move. One thing I want you to know about God is you can't seek him before he seeks you. You and I, apart from grace are dead in our trespasses. Not sick, not mortally wounded, not really ill or weak. We're dead. Do you know what a dead person does when someone's looking for them? Nothing. You didn't choose, if I understand it correctly, and I think I kind of do, you didn't choose to come here. He orchestrated your appearance here today. Now, I know that they could be a manipulative trick. I'm just telling you. You know, there's a lot of manipulation that goes on in the way we do church these days. But I'm not manipulating you. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth so starkly that I'm also telling you that some people will hear the call of Christ and they will not be given ears to listen and accept. That kind of bugs people. But I don't know. I've accepted it. Because you know why? I'm not God. And I don't know what he knows. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, fruit that will last forever. Again, he says in John 6, listen, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me. And I will raise him up on the last day. I tell you the truth. Whoever comes to me, I will never turn away. Never turn away. Boy, that's commitment. That's committed. So one thing I want you to understand, if you choose to come here, you're never going to hear what's called a seeker-sensitive message. You know why? Because I don't believe that they exist. I'm not encouraging you to believe in a doctrine or be pleased with the people at church. You will be taught doctrine, and you will meet people that genuinely love you and genuinely love Christ. But if you walk just long enough, you'll find a reason not to like us. It's just the way it goes. So I'm not calling you to us. I'm introducing you to him. You know what? That gives me a lot of courage. You know why? Because I don't have to sell anything. I can tell you exactly what I think he has shown me without worry. Because it's not dependent on me to make you believe. 
I just have to deliver the food. It's up to God whether you'll eat it or not. So that's what I do. This is a king. I'm introducing you to a king who's going to reveal things about you and things about life that you are not going to be comfortable to hear. The things he tells you will oftentimes offend you. He's going to lead you to places of surrender and abandonment to self, which is never easy. And one thing I've learned about him is there's no stopping how much he wants. <laughs> See, only those who are really, truly called by the Spirit can accept that. Jesus Always the master tactician goes right to the deepest missing piece, the deepest hole of this woman's heart. Remember what he asked her? You remember? He asked her for water. Why? That's what she came for. She came for water. This woman's greatest need was thirst. And I'm not talking about physical thirst. She had a great thirst that was unquenched. She thirsted for a perfect love, one that gave her value, one that gave her purpose, one that gave her significance, and she never had it, but she knew it existed. Jesus asked the woman, give me a drink. The woman opens her mouth. From the instant she opens, the reality of what is in her heart comes out. All the pain of disillusionment all the pain of rejection, all the pain of abandonment, it pours out from her. She's cynical, she's suspicious, she seems to be a woman who is deeply depressed with life. Can I tell you something? Living in a world like ours, with all the good things, it's easy to get depressed. I think there's probably here who's felt bitter disillusionment. She's tired of empty promises. This woman clearly does not believe in fairy tales anymore. Why is she at the well? That's the question you have to ask at noon. Why would she have come to the well at noon? So you've got to understand the background here. Nobody goes to the well at noon. You know why? This is the end of spring, the beginning of summer. Do you know what time that was? 12 o'clock when the sun is at its pinnacle. It was probably 100 degrees. Nobody comes to get water at that time. Women would have come at 5 in the morning to get it done before their husbands went to work so that they could make breakfast and get the family off on their way. Nobody went at noon. Why did she go at noon? Nobody really knows, but I think I got an idea. She's pretty certain that no one's going to be there. She doesn't want to see anybody. That's how deeply depressed people can get. That's how deeply disillusioning life can be when you keep searching for the purpose of your life in places that won't give you the satisfaction that you know exists. Eventually, you'll just give up. She didn't want to see nobody. Nobody. Just let me get my water, let me go back home, and don't talk to me. She's pretty certain that no one else will be there. Her disillusionment, it runs deep. See, everybody gets up at around 5 a.m. to prepare for the day, but she's chosen, she's chosen because of her pain to isolate herself. You know what I see about this? is that she's done a really good job of constructing thick walls between herself and everyone else because she knows what it is to feel that. Maybe physically, but most certainly emotionally. And she's like, I'm going to build such thick walls, ain't no one going to hit me again. <laughs> I feel bad for this woman. So bad I want to cry. She has chosen to isolate herself. Maybe she doesn't feel welcomed by the other women. Maybe she can't stand to think about all the things that she's been denied. There are most likely mothers there with their daughters and sons carrying the water jugs back, and it makes her heart sick to see it. 
Maybe she's just simply depressed and can't get herself out of bed in the morning. She's not really sleeping, but she's got no reason to get out of bed. Because after all, no future, right? There's nothing to be excited about the day for her. Maybe, possibly, it, she thinks it would be better if she had not been born. You might ask yourself, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, I'll tell you, because Jesus leads her to the place where she tells on herself. See, that's why we really got to be frightened of Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't look into us and say, let me show you what you can't see. What he does is see what you don't want to look at and then gets you to rat on yourself. That's what he does. He gets you to tell on you so that when it comes out of your mouth, you'll hear it. And you'll go, oh, I can't believe I just said that. That's what he does. He's a master tactician. Let me tell you something about God right now. He's a great wrestler. I wrestled a little bit in high school. It was too much effort, so I quit. But one thing I learned about wrestlers is that we have to get close to the person, and one of the great tricks is you push against them and get them to push back and use all their strength and weight against you. And once you feel that shift happening, that's when you turn and use their weight against them. That's what Jesus did to this lady. He gets her to use all of her weight to push back at Jesus because she's like, I'm tired of taking it on the chin. I'm tired of having my heart hurt. You're not going to hurt me. No one's going to hurt me. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you say. I'm done. And Jesus gets her to that place and then bam, throws her right on the ground by her own weight. He tells her that he's what she needs, and only he can solve her thirst. That's what he says. He says, give me water. She goes, you don't even have a bucket to get it. Where are you going to get this water? He goes, lady, if you knew who was asking you for water, you'd be asking me for water because I got water for you that you'll never be thirsty about. And what's her answer? Oh, thank you, Jesus, for coming. She's like, oh, oh okay, Sure. I've heard this before. Let me guess. I'm what you need, right? I've heard this. See, I've heard this one before. Really, you need me, right? Is that what you're trying to tell me? My life will be incomplete until I give you my love? That's what she's saying. She's giving him a lot of shade. And we don't really know why until this happens. He says, yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. Do me a favor. Go get your husband and come back. We'll talk about it. Oh, crap. She did it again. I could see her face with my eyes. All that anger, all that disillusionment. She's standing there like a kid. The walls, they're gone. And there she is exposed. <sighs> the woman replies, I have no husband. You're correct, Jesus said. You've had five husbands. Now the man you're living with is not even your husband. She is emotionally exposed. I have to ask myself, why did Jesus do this? Did he do this? Because this is the way we sometimes think, that God wants to take us and rub our nose in the mess of our life. Did Jesus want to treat her like a puppy and rub her nose in the mess of her life? No. You know why? We're not dogs. We're image bearers. We're created in the image of God. He doesn't do it to make her feel ashamed he does it so that she can see what she doesn't want to look at. What Jesus did was take this woman to a mirror. She lived her whole life refusing to look at her greatest problem. I imagine this woman's heart was broken over and over and over. I imagine her cynicism was deeply rooted in all the lies and all the broken promises. But she lived a life that refused to look at her greatest problem. 
The truth is, she was trying to satisfy her deepest thirst by drinking from polluted wells. Her idol was love. You think to yourself, that can't be an idol. Oh, it is. Lots of people fall for that idol. If someone would just love me, then I'll be satisfied. The world is filled with people said, well, if only, if only I had this, or if only I had done that, if I had only gone this way or gone that way, if I wouldn't have gotten hooked up with that person and went in this direction, if only, if only, if only, if only, then my life would be better. Then I'll be truly happy. What she didn't know was that she had a missing piece because when God created her, he created her with the gaping hole in her heart. She wanted a perfect love. The problem is you cannot find perfect love here. No one, as much as they promise, can give you the perfect love they even may intend or want to give you. It will always leave you short. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what success you look for. I don't care what you achieve. I don't care what you earn. It will always fall short. And guess what? If that's all you want, you can have it. But I assure you, you'll lose it when you breathe your last breath. Don't have to be religious to know that's the truth. That was my whole life. I was the guy who searched and groped for significance. So I'm not going to appeal to your intellectual objections or your doubts. You know what? I'm only speaking to the ones who want more than what you can deliver to yourself. I'm only speaking to the ones who want more than you know that the world can offer you. See, the world can offer you many, many things, but it cannot offer you what only Christ can give you. And he said it. He said, my love is so good that it is like a spring that wells up inside of you. You know what I've learned about a spring? You can muddy a spring up. You could put rocks into a spring. You can even pour cement over a spring. But you cannot stop the water from coming up. No matter what you do. When he claims you, when he calls you as his own, when you know by the Holy Spirit that you need him, he will satiate you when you are at your last drop. And I can assure you, I felt like I was at my last drop more than I can count. But I also know this, that there are people in this room who are always going to be satisfied with themselves. I know that there are going to be people here that are always going to be happy with only the wor- what the world can offer. And you know what I say to you? There's nothing here for you. I got nothing to give you. There's no truth that's going to make a difference for you. You have what you want. But I do have to tell you this. If that's what you choose to focus your love on, your purpose in your existence, you will lose it. And what you will live for, because we are told we live eternally, whether we believe in Christ or not. We will live in eternity where everything we have loved and valued will have been snatched from our hands. And we will be left with bitterness, resentment, and anger for eternity. That's scary. It's insulting. But it's the truth. So where does this leave us? This leaves us with Jesus at the end telling this woman who, what her greatest need was. And what's her response? It's funny. She tries to go back to religion. Wait, I could tell you're a prophet because you told me something that's really uncomfortable. But how about if I just intellectualize it and say, I'll go to church for a little while. Where do I go to church? And you know what Jesus said? I'm not talking about church, lady. I'm talking about a hole in your heart. You could go to church till you're blue in the face and it ain't going to change nothing for you. But if you let me fill that hole, your whole life becomes different. And she goes, man, I'm in. Where do I go? And he says, well, I got great news for you. I'm the one that can fill the hole. You were made for me. 
You weren't made for you. You weren't made for that special someone that we love to believe exists. Only I can give your life true purpose and true meaning, and I can make it last. Last beyond the days you have on this earth. I have come to find you, and unless I become your first love, you will always be thirsty. What am I asking today? First of all, I'm asking for the believer to find comfort in a God who loves us so much that he would go out of his way for us. I want you to think about this. If Jesus is the one who created the universe, as the scripture says, he felt heat to the point of nausea. You ever been nauseated when you're working in the heat of the day? He felt the aching pain of the gravity that he created. His feet felt the stones that his mouth commanded into existence. He felt his mouth dry, not able to become, find spit in it because of the dehydration to find you. You didn't look for him. He came to look for you. And to those who are wayward, what's causing you to stay away? Is it shame? Because Jesus isn't interested in shame. It does nothing. It brings him no glory. He wants you to come back. Remember the prodigal son. Forget about that. I don't care. I don't want you to pay or earn your way back. You're my child. You've always been my child. I created all this for us. You're back home. Remember you're my child. Live like you're my child. Let's leave the past in the past. And to those who do not believe, why not? What causes you to say no? Are you satisfied with the world? Because if you are, okay, I don't hate you. You can even come over to my house and we can have dinner. But if you know that this place is a dead end road, Jesus tells you to come and follow me. Now, I'm not going to tell you to pray a prayer because there's no prayer in the Bible. I'm not going to ask you to walk an aisle as if that's proof. I'm going to ask you to come back next week. I'm going to ask you to follow him from this day forward. As we bring up the worship team, I want you to think about what your response is. Because I've got more bad news. It's all what everybody wants, right? i got more bad news for you. To make no decision is to make a decision. See, Jesus is threatening in this way too. He doesn't give us an escape route. You're either with him or you're with yourself. Now, you might be comfortable with that, but I know who I am, and I need to be covered by Christ. Let's stand up and let's worship. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I.
uncomfortable here uh, we're largely isolated just like this woman right we go from our house to our car from our car to our work right into our cubicle then we go back to our car we wave at our neighbor maybe and then we go into our house that's not what God planned you know we're not the center of the universe he is and when we start to circulate around him, it's like everything falls into place. 
what does this mean? Some people are going to want to receive Jesus today. Scriptures are clear. He says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Save me. Save me. Save me. I need to be saved. Jesus, save me. I can say it. I'll say it a million times. Save me. I know who I am. I know who I am. Can't trick me. I need salvation, and you do too. Whether you want to receive it or not, that's not up to me. But you can receive him today. And to those who are depressed, here is where God will bring you some level of peace. He's not going to make it go away all at once. You're still going to struggle with it, but here's the place where you can come, where you can feel welcomed, where you could feel loved, if you're willing. You know what I've learned about depression? Sometimes it's where we want to be. There's your offer. Let's pray. But when we pray, I want you to hold hands because I'm looking forward to the day when all the boundaries that we have put up will be torn down. Every single prejudice, every single fear, every single anger and resentment, all the things that separate us from one another are going to be gone in an instant of time. I am looking forward to that day. And I know this, that I do not labor in the Lord in vain. For I know that if I hold on, I will reap a harvest of righteousness in the right time. I know it. I know it. That way I won't quit. Let's pray. Father God, you are awesome and you have given us an awesome salvation. This is not a mere religion. Lord, I'd like to say that we're not religious. I'm saying that we are spirit-filled and we are brought to life and you are bringing us to life. We are both healed and we're healing. Lord, you have saved us from our past, you have saved us in our present, and you have saved us for the future. Lord, you have completed the work even though we only taste it now Lord be glorified be glorified in this church be glorified in this neighborhood be glorified in our homes be glorified in our works Lord pull us out be strength for us and we pray this with one voice in Jesus name and all the saints said amen you have a wonderful Easter I'm so grateful you came